Well, let, let's take a look at the war of dr on drugs, right? I mean, it's been declared probably 20 times in the last uh, 20 years or so. Every couple of years it's declared. Uh, it's declared against a background of understanding. Uh, for example, it was studied years ago by the RAND Corporation, the main government advisory corporation, and the Army, in which they investigated uh, just straight cost-benefit analysis of various ways of treating the drug problem. Drug problem's here, it's not in Colombia. Uh, so uh, they said, well, you know, which ways of dealing with the problem here are cost effective? And they found, uh, which will surprise no one who's paid attention to the history, that the most cost effective way of doing it uh, is prevention and treatment. Okay? In fact, if you think about it, that's the way one of the worst drug problems has been handled. I mean, there is a drug which is much worse than cocaine. It's called tobacco. It kills far more people uh, than uh, cocaine does. And it was handled pretty well by uh, cultural change. So if you look through the 1980s, it's a class issue. So people <coughs> with education and you know, degree of privilege uh, simply adopted a, a more healthy lifestyle. Uh, they stopped smoking, they stopped eating red meat, uh, they didn't drink as much coffee, and so on. There were no police, you know, the, no, nobody uh, uh, carried out chemical warfare in uh, North Carolina and uh, Kentucky to destroy tobacco fields. Uh, they, it was simply an educational process, a kind of cultural change that led to a significant decline of the use of by far the most dangerous drug uh, among people who were uh, a part of that uh, cultural change that took place thanks to their privilege. Okay, now that's exactly what the RAND and the Army a study years ago. Uh, they weren't, of course, discussing tobacco, but that's exactly what they concluded about um, hard drugs and, or marijuana. They said the best, the cheapest, and the most effective way of dealing with it is prevention and treatment. Well, there's another way, uh, use of police. Okay, that's much less effective and much more costly. Uh, there's a third way, uh, interdiction at the borders. That's still more expensive by quite a large margin and far less of, uh, uh, and f uh, far more costly. And the worst way of all, you know, way more costly than anything else and the totally ineffective, is uh, uh, what we call fumigation, but what in fact is chemical warfare. Uh, I've been down to southern Colombia and seen some of it. It's chemical warfare, which is driving... Uh, huge numbers of peasants off their land, destroying their crops. Uh, Colombia has the second biggest refugee problem in the world after Sudan, uh, and they're driven into urban slums, and multinational corporations come in and start mining, and so on and so forth. That's the least effective and the uh, uh, most costly. And you know the fact that we do it, again, if you can kind of abstract yourself and pretend you're a Martian looking at this, is just kind of unimaginable. I mean, the number of people in Colombia killed by U.S. tobacco is way beyond the number of Americans killed by Colombian cocaine. If you go to a country like China, it's astronomically more. Okay, do they have a right to come to the United States and uh, carry out chemical warfare in uh, North Carolina and Kentucky because uh, uh, they have a tobacco problem and it's coming from here? Yeah, I mean, you can't even speak the words. It's so outlandish. But we do it, and we think it's just fine. You know? Even though it's known to be the least effective, uh, the most costly, uh, and totally immoral, as we see right away if we think of the situation reversed. Well, that's been going on for decades. That's the war on drugs. Uh, the use, it hasn't affected the use of drugs here at all. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, just take a look at the cost of drugs and availability, barely changed. Well, you know, when people carry out a so-called war for years and years, uh, when they know what the consequences are going to be, and they have plenty of evidence that that's exactly what the consequences are, and it has no effect on drugs, a, a rational person will begin to ask themselves, is this a war on drugs? Okay, I mean, are they totally insane? You know? uh, is it a war on drugs? Or is it a war to, uh, uh, in Colombia, for example, a part of a war of counterinsurgency? Uh, to clear peasants off the land so that uh, multinational corporate mining corporations and agribusiness can come in and so on. And in the United States, is it a war on drugs 
or is it an effort to get rid of uh, what are called the dangerous classes? Uh, people, if you look at the history of prohibition, there's good work in legal history on the history of prohibition. It's very typically aimed at what are called the dangerous classes, uh, people who are kind of getting in our hair. So what we call prohibition, you know, uh, the banning of alcohol, uh, wasn't aimed at uh, wealthy people in Westchester County, New York, uh, and so on. They could do whatever they liked. But it was aimed at working class people and uh, uh, immigrants and, uh, you know, the, the bars in downtown Manhattan. Uh, marijuana, if you look at the prohibition of marijuana, it was not on medical grounds. It was because it was used by Mexicans. Uh, and then it was used in the 1920s by blacks in the Harlem Renaissance. And then, of course, in the 1930s, the Bureau of uh, Narcotics had a big problem. Prohibition came in, and they had this huge apparatus, and what are they going to do with it? And so they had to find something, so, okay, I figure we'll go after marijuana. But the drug of the dangerous classes, and if, you kind of, if you look at the whole, in fact, this goes back to the 19th century. I mean, in 19th century England, uh, gin was uh, prohibited, but whiskey wasn't. Well, just take a look at who was drinking them. Uh, and that runs right through history. These are wars to control the dangerous classes. Uh, in fact, the explosion of the war on drugs here was in the 1980s and since. And during that period, uh, uh, the U.S. incarceration programs just flew off the spectrum. I mean, back around 1980, uh, the U.S. was sort of slightly at the high end of industrial societies and per capita incarceration, but within the spectrum. And now it's five to ten times as high as uh, comparable countries. Uh, not because there's more crime. In fact, crimes remain kind of steady. and It's still relative to other countries what it was. Uh, and if you take a look at who's in jail, yeah, the, pe the useless people, the black males, the people who we can't incorporate in our society. This is the residue of slavery, of course, they don't have different genes. Uh, so yeah, they're the ones we get rid of. Uh, and in Latin America, there's a name for it. It's called social cleansing. Uh, the dangerous classes, you send out the death squads and you know, kill them and leave them under the bridge. We're more humane here, so you put them in jail forever. Uh, and uh, the, pr the imprisonment, uh, uh, the, uh, it's not just the level of incarceration, but the savagery of it is just unknown in comparable countries. Uh, like Amnesty International did a study a couple of years ago of uh, children in prison without chance of parole, so permanently, permanent. Uh, imprisonment. I don't remember the exact numbers, but you know, they, they didn't deal with countries that don't have statistics, you know, like uh, Sudan. But in the countries where you know something about what's going on, I think they found something like maybe 2,500 cases and about 2,400 were in the United States. I um, mean, this includes cases of, you know, 12-year-old kid who happened to be in a room where uh, a felony murder was carried out. Okay, he's in jail for life. Um, actually, I've seen cases like this in prison, which are, well, I'll tell you one case, just I don't know how prevalent it is. But during the civil rights years, I was down in Jackson, Mississippi for, for demonstration, and uh, uh, I was with Howard Zinn and a couple other people from up here, and we designated ourselves uh, with proper self-congratulation as a New England professor's delegation. <laughs> so we were <laughs> escorted through the prison by the police chief and that sort of thing. and. Uh, in the prison, Jackson, Mississippi prison, which is not bad by usual standards. I've been locked up myself in worse prisons. But uh, as we were walking down the halls, uh, we passed one of these huge cages, you know, a lot of people in the cages, and uh, they were all black, uh, black men. But as we walked past, uh, a child uh, tapped on the bars and asked, happened to be standing here, he asked me if I could get him a drink of water. So I turned to the police chief and I said, can I get him a drink of water? There's a fountain down the hall. So he said, sure. So I came over and gave him a drink of water. Well, when we got back to the office to talk to the chief, I, we asked him, well, what's that kid doing in there? So he asked some clerk to look it up. And it turned out that they just found him in the streets. And they didn't know what to do with him. And so they put him in jail. And he'll stay there for the rest of his life. Now, cases like that are not counted. You know, but they, they're just part of the savagery of imprisonment 
of the dangerous classes. And most of, you know, a very high percentage of the people in uh, prison are uh, drug-related offenses. So you find a kid in Roxbury with a joint in his pocket, you know, happens three times, okay, he's in jail for who knows how many years. It has nothing to do with reducing drugs. You can see that from the statistics. But it does have something to do with purifying the society of the people who we find threatening, the dangerous classes, usually people we're crushing in one form or another. I don't see any other rational interpretation of the so-called war on drugs. Thank you. Petra. Uh, 